Hey, how's it? Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Good evening. Welcome to another evening with Mel and Charlie. On here on Facebook Live, today is what, the 14th? Today? Today's the 14th. Yep. It's a beautiful Thursday. We'd like to say aloha uh, to our viewership. Hope you folks had a great day today. I can tell you right now, I had a great breakfast. I posted, did you see what I posted for food today? I made yeah, some, I you know, and show, show you pork. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I saw. Ooh. I saw. I saw. I never get the invite, but I saw the picture. <laughs> <laughs> well, this morning I had I had eggs and toast from my lovely wife. Oh, she watching, you she watching your diet. That's good. You remember growing up, they had that little thing where you get your toes, you put them on the frying pan, they cut one circle out, and you break That's, the egg on the inside. Bro, it's exactly how she makes them. Yeah. <laughs> and the little hole, the little hole that is cut out, that little circle is what I used to, what the Portuguese call molha. Oh, All the Portuguese out there are going to know exactly what I'm saying. When you molha the bread yeah. into the yeah. yolk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I would like to say that um, my wife went to um, Big Safe today, and on Thursday she told me that she brought home this bread. It's a it's a Japanese brand. You know, Japanese bread that it, it's really dense. Yeah. But uh, it's it's chewy and dense. You know, it reminds me of Leonard's malasada for some reason. Anyway, first time I tried it, she brought it home, and. Um, I took a piece and I just made a sandwich with that uh, for, for a late lunch. And uh, I just tried it and I said, man, this is something that would go good. Like what you're saying, make one hole in the middle, broke the egg. I like when the bread, like you said, when it's dense like that. And, and uh, yeah. Patsy brought home on loaf last week. I, I, I don't think it was a Japanese bread, but it, it was the first time she ever saw it. Yeah, and it was delicious. It was, it was, it was dense. It was like my grandma's old uh, sweet bread when she used to make. Okay, it's hard to find that now, but you know who else yes, makes everybody that? share, share, share. We got Dr. Capono Chong Hansen tonight. He'll be popping in in a few minutes. Um, guaranteed informative show tonight. Uh, looking forward to it. Tomorrow night, feel good Friday, and on Saturday, Billy B. <laughs> yeah. Coming on. So thank you all for you guys' nice comments. He read the comments and uh that helped him uh agree to come on. He's, he's, <laughs> we're gonna have some fun. I have no idea what the heck we're gonna talk about, but we will definitely have a, a newscaster's for a perspective of, of COVID and a whole bunch of other things. Pop up, my kick, whatever. So yeah, <laughs> Saturday, Billy V tomorrow, feel good Friday, and um tonight, of course, Dr. Capono Chong Hansen. If you Follow Dr. Capono Chong Hansen on Facebook. Uh, I think you you will agree that he's he's concerned, and that's what we're going to get from him tonight. That's what we're going to get from him tonight. We're going to get his his insights, his perspective, uh, and what he thinks about the process as we move forward. So I'm looking forward to it, Charlie. Well, you know, um, today I don't know if you read that uh, article I, I posted. Did I do? Not retract, but I have to go dig up because something just didn't sound right. And it it's it's centered around the complaints received. And uh Hawaii News now even did a a, a news break on it regarding uh out of state travelers coming to Hawaii to take the vaccine shots. Okay. And then I reviewed the statement by um Dr. Lauren Pang, who's a state health officer for the Maui County. Okay. And so when I when I watched it, I, I, I specifically heard him say, and I and I reviewed it again, and he said that a traveler coming from California went into the clinic and said, you know what, I registered under VAMS, which is that vaccination program, right? A management system. And uh, they said that uh, I registered online through VAMS. And so I'm here to take my shot. And he's, the way he responded is if he really didn't know, 
but he said, oh, okay. And then he started to answer the questions of the news reporters. And they said, you know, if someone wants to take the shot, you have to give them. So we gave them. That's, that's sort of a little misleading. And I'll tell you the reason why, what I found out. The CDC bans, that's the only way those who participate can get the vaccine. It has to be out in this, it's, a, it's like a federal monitoring program, right? But if you if you pull up the CDC website and you look on the VAMS, there's all these categories in it. One of the categories is scheduling because it's IT systems automated. If you decide to participate with that under VAMS, they can do the scheduling. So that means that if you register under VAMS and you schedule and you tell them, oh, I'm going to Hawaii, they can schedule it for you already. So unless the hospital on Maui participates in a scheduling, I don't think they do because I know here we don't. The hospitals do it themselves. And so what kind of drew some kind of confusion is that right now we're, we're going to be vaccinating 75 years and older, right? If that was true with what Dr. Pang said, anyone coming from the mainland under Vance if they're not 75 years old, it doesn't matter. Because he said, as long as you registered, you got to give them the shot. When I checked with the hospitals, they said, no, Charlie, if you don't participate, if the person comes, they call in. We ask them a set of questions. If they don't meet the guidelines, we cannot vaccinate them. Plus, what if they only come for one week? Where do they get the second shot from? And what if they go someplace to get two different shots because you cannot mix the shots, right? If it's Pfizer, you go Pfizer, Moderna, Moderna. So we wouldn't give them the shot anyway if we know that they're, they're, going, they're not going to be here long enough to take the second shot. So when I saw that, I said, okay. So I, I posted a statement um, of such. The way, I, the way I read the VAMS website, um, you, your, your clinic or your hospital got to register to be part of it. You know, you got to be part of this, this network. Um, that's right, how they right. get the vaccine. Right. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. But I mean, I, I you know, I, I saw the outrage from the Maui people and mm -hmm. I, I read the outrage from people from other islands as well. No, and, because uh, what I was saying, if, if, if it is, if it is what he say it is, then if you got a set of rules, right, on your island, to bypass those rules, go online and register with VAMS now. You don't need, you don't need to pay attention to the rules. But see, Canada, it, it causes one big cluster boop, if yeah. everybody just make up their own rules. That's why, I, man, I, I and, wish. And I wouldn't, you know, the, the Wahine probably was making a scene. And rather than argue and debate, just give them the shot and get them out of there. Um, I don't know what really happened, but I can see that happening. But it was obvious that Dr. Pang had no clue what was going on. Yeah. Uh, he had absolutely no idea how VAMS works. He has no idea. And, uh, you know, he was typically the CYA answer. He didn't know. Uh, rather than say, I don't know, and I'll, I'll look into it. No, he just created an answer. And that's, that's kind of how it works. But, you know, the vaccines that we get needs to be reserved for the residents of Hawaii. That, that's, I mean, plain and simple. Because the, the waiting list in California, for example, is very long. Yeah. So it's it's you know if you're if you're concerned and you're elderly and you want to get the vaccine, you register in VAMS and you get to Hawaii, you get the shot. That that it cannot be that way. Again, the people with money, the rich, the ones that can come here, fly, get a vaccine, and go home, we'll, we'll get our vaccines and our local residents, especially those that live in the outlying areas, that no more transportation, that cannot get to these clinics. You know they're gonna be shoved off, and that's crap, man. That's just crap. And uh, we'll see. We'll see how this thing turns out. You know, mm -hmm. I'm glad the media picked up on it and and uh, and did a story, at least raised awareness because you know we we gotta we <laughs> we're doing a poor job about getting the vaccines out. I mean, we're not doing a very good job getting them out to begin with. Those vaccines should be for local people and, and local people that, that need it the most. Mm -hmm. No, needs it the most. 
Well, you know, it's um, I received uh, a report. Well, I was engaged in a conversation uh, today with an individual who I guess has is privy to some some info. And I, you know, on Kauai, I cannot speak for the other islands, but on Kauai, we've done a really good job in trying to hold this virus down. But then, you know, there's this underswell of, of wanting to open, yeah. So I'm hoping that's what I that's what I want to ask Dr. Uh, Chong Hansen about is if we do open, you know, how much of a risk and how much can we recover? You know what I mean? If the numbers start ballooning, how fast can we flip in time to stop it and and and, and get come back? That's 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 what it is. And I think he's trying to hook up his phone that's going to come up on a separate screen. That's uh, I think he's connecting to audio. Yeah, he, he runs separate. He has one yeah. for his, his camera and one for his audio. Yeah, aloha. Sorry. Yep. Yeah, you're right, Uncle Charlie. This is what I got to do. Last time I tried doing them on both, it was that was the freeze, the freeze <laughs> ending. It's amazing though how your video and your audio syncs perfectly. Yeah. There's no lag. There's no lag between the two um, the two devices. Yeah, it's pretty uh, my cool. light my lighting situation is a little <laughs> off here. Uh, no, no, no. Don't you worry about it. You're coming in nice and crisp and clear and and uh all okay, right, everybody. Gonna... This is Dr. Oh, yeah. yeah, you're good, man. You're good. Dr. Kapono yeah. Chong Hansen from the uh, West Kauai Community Health Center, I guess is what it's called. Oh, now you're it's dark, bro. Kauai Community Health Center. Yeah, hold on. Kauai, Kauai Community Kauai. Health Center. I, I work on the west side location, but we have a location in Kapa'a and our administrative offices are in Lihue. So okay. we serve the whole island. Yeah. Okay. You yeah. might want to turn on the light because you just disappeared, bro. Yeah, you... I'm, I'm, there, we, there we go. You know, I'm not turn it on. You just, uh, you know, you got to bang them. <laughs> I, I I know what it's like, man. I know I know what it's like. <laughs> okay, so um, I think what he meant is when he give you one shot, if no go in, he just gonna bang him and hope he drive that bugger through the skin. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. You having a re reaction? Just conk, conk. You see it now? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so doc, it's been a while. Not a very long while, but you know it's, the, the thing with COVID is it doesn't matter if it's a week or a day, things change on the fly so uh lots going on vaccines are being put out we you know a lot of things happening um variants and so uh i don't know where you want to start doc i mean we'll leave it up to you where, where do you want to start my friend well, i think i think vaccines are a good place to start and I, I heard a little bit of what you guys were talking about you know earlier um about sounds like there's some um backlash or strong feelings about travelers or visitors getting vaccines in, in Hawaii. And um, I didn't read the media coverage about it. I've heard some, you know, feelings about that. Um, I saw that, you know, I watched that town hall. I think Mel, you watched that too on, on, uh, from Maui. And to be honest, I thought that, that the a medical officer from Maui had a good answer. I, I, I think, you know, if there are people that are going to be here long enough, you know, 21 days in between the first and second vaccine, I think it's appropriate for them to get the vaccine. I mean, I'm not going to say I would ever prioritize them over other people, you know, other local mm -hmm. residents. Um, but, you know, they present risk to our people too. You know, I'm, so that's just my, you know, my take on, on that whole situation. I think it's, um, you know, I, I am completely about residents first and take care of our people first. But um, my personal opinion is, is, is beyond that. I don't think we need to get too worked up about it. But I think you guys probably know there's a different attitude sometimes between, you know, local residents as far as how willing, uh, how persistent they're willing to be to get something like this and then, and then other people. And, you know, um, it can be frustrating that the difference in attitude as far as how it goes. So, um, you know, I, I would encourage all people to try to respect the tiers, you know, the way that they are. They, they were thought out. They're not, you know, there's gray areas about 
how things should be prioritized. But to me, they're reasonable. You know, the way the approach that's happening is, is, is reasonable to me. And I think that presuming that we have the resources, you know, get, getting the vaccine, we're going to, you know, we're going to um, try to loosen those up and hit the people that are the highest risk. But I can update a little bit about where we are in Hawaii um, on the vaccines. Uh, we just had our call with Dr. Berriman this morning, you know, our kind of uh, physician leadership group Hui, um, this morning. So um, I believe we're about 4,500 people on Kauai have been vaccinated so far. And I know that there's been a lot of um, frustration on Oahu, you know, from my colleagues too, that were unaffiliated with hospitals about whether they're getting their vaccines. And I, I think Kauai, you know, we're just lucky. We have a manageable number we have very, you know, relatively few people, you know, in leadership positions, and we all generally work well together. So I think that we are ahead of the game, and I think that we will probably continue to be ahead of the game as far as that goes. I know um, the Department of Health is offering vaccines three days a week. They're hitting um, the DOE right now. They've already hit some of the um, other essential workers, um, and they're ramping up their ability to do 1,500 um, vaccinations a week. The hospitals, Wilcox, uh, KVMH, Mahilona, tomorrow is the first is the first day for um, 75 and above, all, all people. Um, and we've been helping them with that. Um, our community health center is just has, is in the process of registering with VAM so that we can also um, distribute the vaccine. So, you know, when you look at how many people we have, which is about 75,000, 77,000, our goal is to get 70% you know, hopefully we can get 70% of people to agree to get the vaccine. And that's kind of our general goal for herd immunity. And, um, you know, by breaking down the numbers, summertime, you know, by the next school year, we might be, you know, you, we have a good chance to get the, the island in a good situation where we're, we're um, protected and vaccinated if everything works out as planned. Um, so I feel hopeful about it for Kauai at least. Um, so I just wanted to mention that um, I could, I'm not sure if people are getting any frustration about getting vaccinated right now and how to register. You know, we're certainly having to help some of our seniors um, because you got to go online and a lot of, you know, my, doc, my patients tell me, hey, doc, you know, I, you know, I don't do online, you know that, right? You know, and I'm like, yeah, I know. I'm. So, you know, w w we help them through it. Um, I know KVMH and Mahilona are also allowing one caregiver per um, kupuna to also get vaccinated. So that's another way to get it you know, right now, the 15th, the 19th, and the 22nd in the mornings are the, are the dates that are set right now. And I know the hospitals are, are thinking about trying to continue offering vaccines five days a week, you know, so we're all looking to ramp up our ability to vaccinate people. And um, I have a meeting tomorrow with um, the, the district health office to talk about how our community health center is going to fit in. I think likely we're going to try to kind of get more out into the community, to the places uh, where people might have less access to the hospitals. And I, I think I heard you guys mention something about that. But, um, you know, for all the viewers, we kind of want to hear right now, you know, where, where where are the needs and where can we get to people that need it? Um, I think, you know, from Maui, there are also some more clusters involving um, um, uh, more congregate living and Pacific Islanders and, um, I think we really need to think about how we're going to hit those communities too as a higher priority, even if they're lower age groups. So um, that's the main things about where we are. I know the next steps for the county is to try to start getting um, like food um, industry, grocery workers, post office, ag workers. I heard from Kauai Coffee, they're starting to make their arrangements um, and then public transportation. So. Um, things are moving along with the vaccines. Um, so that's on the positive side. I think we probably should talk a little bit about the concerns about the vaccine, contraindications and reactions too. But um, I thought maybe I'd pause for a second there if you're seeing any questions or if you guys had any concerns about the rollout as it is right now. Well, the the, the ag, ag employees, I, I know some of them have already gone. They've already gone. They rolled out Monday, so which is good. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted to touch a little before you go out, um, before we go to the next phase. And that is, you know, it still seems, and I don't know what it is, and maybe, you know, with your, your participation with um, Dr. Berman and the rest of the group, because we seem to have a very 
cohesive set of individuals and very focused, very well focused and, and target specific on what the accomplishments are to be gained here on Kauai. It doesn't seem that we're on the other island. So I, it, it almost seems as if, again, you know, I've always been one to say messaging has to be so important so people will start trusting. Because we know on one hand, the, the LG will release a report and you just look at his comments and it's a, it dovetails with what the mayor of Maui said. You just look at the comments and it's almost there, there nobody wants to believe in because they say we're doing good. And yet they're the second highest in case, uh, you know, in cases statewide. And so, you know, it's, it's those kind of stuff that people say, you know, and then to say that they're doing good with the vaccination and yet the CDC report um, rolled out that Hawaii is the third lowest in getting, you know, in getting the vaccines out. So, you know, when they do stuff like that, you know, who do you, you know, I don't, I don't want to be Mr. Skeptic and say, well, I don't believe the CDC. Well, I don't believe this. I'm just saying that kind of messaging should have, that kind of news from the CDC I, at least or whoever we shouldn't even be getting in there. It should be like, you know what? We may not be hitting our target goals. We might be behind by a month, but man, we're sure ramping it up. If you hear that, at least everybody can be buying into the program. Like, okay, we're going, we're going. But then you get these hiccups and you have out of state people coming in. And I, and I, and I, I agree with you. You know, the more arms you can put the vaccine into, the better we can get back to being normal, right? But, you know, when news comes out at a time like this, when a lot of people are waiting, because the thing I hear about every day is, hey, they're saying that it's 65 and above, but we're only at 75 and above. And so that's why some of the islands, some of the other counties is writing into Mel and I and asking, hey, you know, did you hear about this? And I said, you know, the best thing is you got to check with your county because it seems like we're doing it pretty quickly. So we're kind of like ahead of the rest of the state. I mean, that's the way it looks. And so what's, what's, your, what's your read on that, uh, Doc, as far as, you know, the top administration, some of the messaging they're putting out? Because some of the people said it's almost non-believable nowadays. And, and it's, it's sad. It's sad. Well, you know, I, I think the, you know, the people that you're talking about, they have uh, um, – they have their perspective on how they're going to, you know, I guess, spin things and characterize things. Mm -hmm. And I guess to be, to, to be honest about it, I think it's, it's somewhat irrelevant. I mean, you know, like the vaccine is going to be good. I, I, well, no guarantees, but you know, everything is looking like the vaccine is going to be good, no matter what your perspective is, you know, the LG wants more of the vaccine, you know, so that he can, I, I think, you know, keep doing the type of travel protocols that we've had and allow tourism to happen and travel to happen without much restrictions. Um, and I think that, you know, everyone is sort of seeing what's happening on Maui and raising their eyebrows and thinking, hey, you know, like this doesn't look like it's going to be ma it's managed well. And, um, you know, I don't like that messaging either. Um, I think that there could be more honesty about that situation and more um, uh, willingness to to criticize what the decisions were and adapt. I mean, I, I, I've said this before, you know, no one expected that you're going to make it perfect from the beginning. But what's bothersome is that it doesn't seem to be an openness to like looking at a situation and saying, well, that's not working well. Let's change it. You know, there's a it seems to be that there's a there's this just you know, continuous sort of like effort to say, let's just say it's working well and then let's make everybody follow what that plan was. So that bothers me. But that doesn't change um, the value of the vaccines. And I think it doesn't change um, the trust that people should have in their doctors. Um, and I can't speak for the other healthcare systems on Maui, but in general, healthcare systems, you know, the majority of people that are working there are well intended, you know, and are, and are not. I don't think they have an interest in sugarcoating things just to make things look good for the state. Um, so I understand the frustration, you know, I mean, I kind of was surprised by that too, at the federal level, all of a sudden it was like, Oh, let's, 
to vaccinate 65 and above. And, and we're kind of like, wait a minute, we, we were told the tier was 75. We just got prepared for 75, you know, and now you're kind of throwing this on top where you're kind of encouraging people to say, hey, I should be included because I'm 65 and above. Personally, my take on it is it, it is, you know, the risk increases um, a lot as you increase from 65, 75, 80. So I still think it's appropriate to hit 75 and above first. And we sort of, the wheels were in motion, you know? I mean, we already had 75 and above scheduled and we're trying to hit their caregivers, which is, um, you know, not exactly following the tier. So I think it's, it's reasonable to keep following those. But I do think that with that change, and I, it sounds like the Biden administration is trying to make some changes to really roll out the vaccine. And so if we get the supplies, that, that they're talking about coming out further, that it'll loosen up pretty quickly. People also need to remember, though, that there's a cold storage kind of issue more for the Pfizer than the Moderna. But, um, you know, we have to get ready to be able to accept it and store it during the amount of time, distribute it during the amount of time. So it takes a little bit of preparation. I mean, it, I know it sounds silly, but like for our for our community health center, we need to we need to get a temperature, you know, a thermometer that is going to um, regulate the temperature and alarm if it goes off, you know, because you can't let that happen if there's a power outage or whatever, and then you don't know that your vaccines all, you know, were were not stored properly, and then maybe they're not going to be that efficacious. So, so I think uh, you know, you can, I would hope people. Can, oh, sorry, go ahead. Be, you can be walking into Baskin and Robbins and say, you know, I came for Jamuka almond fudge, but there's all these vaccine vials in your freezer over there. What's going on? <laughs> we might have to pull in Baskin and Robbins to help out. <laughs> no, but I mean, you, you got we we, you, we got to make those plans. But I I'm pretty confident that that on Kauai we're going to be able to do it well because we work well together. I I mm -hmm. think the other islands will as well. Oahu is just such a different beast though, as far as all the people that need to be involved to get things done. And anytime you involve, involve more people, you involve more personalities. You involve different priorities. You know, their community health centers there, some of them have rolled out already. I think um, uh, Kokua Kalihi Valley is doing their vaccines uh, already, the community health center there, and, y and um, Waianae, which is, which is great. You know, but anytime this stuff happens, it, you know, it comes down to, well, do we have the money to pay staff to be able to, you know, administer these vaccines? Because we're not charging people for them. So, you know, we're not planning to, to make a lot of money off of it. Um, and so how do you devote that time with your staff and then also take care of your regular patient care needs? So it, it takes some it takes some planning. But I, you know, I, I think people should have faith that the majority of people that are involved in this have the best intentions and want to just get the best, you know, get people as quickly as possible, hit the most vulnerable, you know, the ones that are most likely to have complications first. We all want to get the other people as well. But, you know, it's like once you make an exception for one person, you know, then you get more calls and then you're, you know, instead of being able to focus on the logistics and getting this rolled out, you're dealing with people in their, you know, in their demand. So um, I, I would encourage people to have faith in the, in the healthcare system here and, and um, try to just, you know, follow the tiers as they go and it'll run smoother that way. Um, and I, and I, I really just can, can say that I, I have a lot of confidence in Kauai being able to do it. And I have pretty good confidence in my colleagues on the other islands as well. I, I'm not sure exactly about the dynamics over there, um, but I, I think that they were they're going to get it done. And I think you know even if you look at you know Mayor Victorino or or, or the Lieutenant Governor, and you, if you personally don't feel like you trust them, I, they still have an interest in getting the vaccines done as quickly as, and efficiently as possible. You know, Congressman Case uh, was very critical a couple of days ago about the number of vaccine doses that Hawaii had received and the very uh, small amount of numbers that uh, doses that had been actually administered. Is that, is that a concern? Are we not able to, to uh, process these, these recipients quick enough? Because I, I mean, I'm, I hear Kauai, well, for tomorrow at the HHSC, they're, they're booked, they were booked, but are we not able to push out the vaccine quick enough? Is that is that the problem? Because he said we had over a hundred some odd thousand, and we had only given out like forty thousand. Um, I I can't I don't know the details. I okay. mean I haven't felt that way. You know the way that it's it's come to us. You know, I and mean, that's not what I've heard from Kauai. Um, I haven't I haven't heard that from anyone except Congressman Case. So I was kind of concerned, but I. 
I know that Honolulu, I heard the guy on the on the news that one of the health directors from one of the facilities saying that they they were uh, they're waiting for vaccine and they should be wrapping up every every week. We should be getting more and more and more. But another question, you said that you guys don't charge. Um, I did the paperwork for my mother-in-law. She's 80 plus years old. She's going to get hers next week. But they asked for the insurance. Um, are they charging the insurance companies for this vaccine? Do you know? Yeah, there's an administration fee that they charge, um, and and but that I'm told it it should not that it, that it can't be passed on to the patient, so that the insurance can be charged. So yeah, sorry, I didn't I didn't mean to like mislead people that there is no money to be made, but it's I, I don't know exactly how much that fee is, but administering vaccine from a healthcare perspective is not like a you know the, most people look at it as like a loss you know like you could be making more money doing other services I, I, I by, by that time of, but it's important i think it's yeah. because of the eua right because the eua doesn't allow you to have the vaccine sold on the market and someone's be correct I, yeah i guess my the way i was put well it was put to me is the government bought it already so i mean it's yeah. it's it's paid for by our by our government so it's kind of it would be that, that's what like, I, I, I that much I knew. And that's why I was kind of surprised when I did the paperwork <clears throat> and saw they needed your insurance, your name, insurance company, subscriber number, group number. I was kind of surprised that um, are we charging no, insurance no, on I, top of. I think what what it was is um, I checked up on that. And the reason why you put all of that down is because when they report it under the VAMS, they got to show that. You're giving it to someone who who has coverage. It, it's not going to charge it. That was my understanding. They're not going to charge you. Because well, they're, they're, like I said, I think what they charge so that there, you know, the, there's a cost to paying somebody to actually draw it up, you know, spend the time giving the vaccine. There's a cost to storage, and that's that's what generally gets wrapped up in what's called an administration fee. So when you when you you're charging for services, you know, like there's a cost for the vaccine, like just getting the vaccine materials, that has a cost. But there's also a cost of administering the vaccine. So that's what they're allowed to bill the insurance for the administration fee for giving the vaccine, but not for the cost of the vaccine. Okay, so they're, 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 the, the viewers should not be concerned about any out-of-pocket expense for themselves. That's my understanding. And if they're getting an out-of-pocket expense no, I, you know, if it was my patients, I, I'd say, tell me. And if, if other people, you, you should check into whether that's correct or not. And I, I no, have I, heard I there think, have been some Doc, I think if that there. was happening, I think if that was happening, we would have heard by now. Charlie and I would have heard by now. So I don't think that's happening. <laughs> yeah. I really don't think that's happening. Hey, Doc, I good, wanted good. to ask some questions popped on the screen really fast. One of them was uh, your take on the, the new variants. And I guess, get you know, there's... I was just listening to... Uh, one uh, infectious disease expert out of Boston, and they're kind of concerned with some of the new ones that's coming out now, not the UK, but it's uh, supposedly an offshoot of the UK. And it seems even more contagious. You know, they say it was 50 times more contagious. And, and you know, you kind of wonder how, how much more contagious can you go when you say it's even worse than that? I go, gee whiz, you know, have you heard anything? I know. I'm. I, I, well, I'm with you on in the sense of it's like, oh, here's a variant. Oh, wait, now there's three variants. I mean, it's just like, yeah. oh, my gosh, you know, um, and and then there was, oh, there's a variant in Hawaii. Oh, no, actually, it's not here. You know, like the South African <laughs> one, I, you know, it's like, geez, guys. I mean, I, I, all I can say is what I think most people have heard is that we still believe that the vaccines are going to be effective against the variant as far as protection. You know, I, I what I keep hearing is the same as you, that the variants are more infectious, which I believe means that um, at a lower viral load, people could get sick. sick. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't, we, we don't think that that means that the um, vaccines won't be effective. But that relates to some of the things that you guys talk a lot about, you know, which is, are these vaccines um, efficacious in preventing um, the, the vaccinated individual from transmitting it to another person. So can you be vaccinated, still be colonized with enough viral load that you could transmit that virus to an un, uh, unvaccinated person and they could get sick, which is not a typical situation for vaccines. You know, I mean, I, I have to admit, you know, like I, I, I 
kind of was like, why would it be that way? I mean, most vaccines, we don't think about it like that. We don't think that, oh, once you get vaccinated, oh, you can carry measles and then give measles to someone, but you won't get measles. But I do understand that, you know, because of the EUA process, they didn't look at that. They, they really only looked at efficacy in the sense of preventing symptomatic disease in individuals. And in this particular disease, you know, there's been all this concern about all these asymptomatic or posse symptomatic people. Um, so I think that's the most uh, um, interesting uh, connection to these variants. You know, if they're able to infect people and cause disease at a lower viral load, does that mean that our vaccines might you know, still be efficacious for the individual, but um, allow us to infect others who are not vaccinated. Mm-hmm. As far as I understand, it's way too early to tell. Um, mm-hmm. A hopeful thing, though, is that, you know, you know, the state lab and I believe UH are able to do that genomic analysis, which was a surprise to me, to be completely honest. I didn't know that we had that capability. And Dr. Berryman shared that, you know, the district health officers if they see something that seems like it's acting out of the ordinary, they can ask the state lab to run the genomic analysis on it. I believe they're doing random samples anyway, but also, you know, our public health authorities, when they see something, you know, like what did we have that uh, seven, seven cases in a day and it, it sounded like maybe they were all in like one family. Um, well, let's analyze those, those people. Um, and, and I do know that they've talked about, you know, like Hawaii doing some of the genomic analysis, it, it, it can confirm some of the things that people have said, you know, about whether it's community spread or travel related. Well, we can sort of confirm that a lot of the stuff we said for Kauai is travel related because they feed, it's not the same strain. They, these are different strains that are coming, not, you know, not any of those variants that people are getting, you know, concerned about yet, as far as I know, um, but that there are these different strains. So it's, it's a fascinating area. And I think more to come, we just need to watch and wait. One last question from a viewer to, to ask you, with regards to the Pfizer and Moderna, which is that, uh, I guess is the RNA, right? Uh, M- mRNA yeah. vaccine and AstraZeneca, which is the, I guess the old style, you know, how is the comparison between the development of both vaccines? And and what can you tell from the, the data you've seen? Have, have you seen any data related to the AstraZeneca as opposed to the Moderna or Pfizer? Um, I looked more at the Johnson & Johnson the last time I was looking at them. Okay. And AstraZeneca and Johnson Johnson are the viral vector. So they use a virus to get the mRNA in rather than direct mRNA, right. which can sound scary to a lot of people, you know, the, the adenovirus. And I have to admit, I, I need to brush up on AstraZeneca, but for Johnson & Johnson, I know the nice thing about that vaccine is that it's one dose and it's easier to store. You can keep it for three months in a refrigerator. So, you know, if those end up being, you know, getting an EUA, that could be a nice option for Hawaii. I, I don't know um, much more specifics about the trials that led up to it as far as um, mm-hmm. the difference between the mRNA development and those adenovirus um, vaccines that, that were developed as well. Um, but, you know, they were both, they're both relatively quick, but you can't skip steps. You know, they don't let, let any of them skip steps. And so that's how it's gone. Um, and so I, I would imagine just the way the technology is that that's why the antiviruses took a little bit longer, but that's still not the old way. I just wanted to mention that, you know, the old way is, is still much more, um, you know, it's more like the virus of the infection, either weakened or, you know, components of it. So it can't replicate itself, which is, you know, like the polio vaccine that, fed, that that I think feeds into a lot of the fear about vaccines being able to give you the disease. Um, you know, those are still much more, um, they're much more close to the actual virus than, than mRNA vaccines and even these adenovirus vaccines, which are using a, a different kind of essentially harmless virus just to get the mRNA in and, and then get it, you know, same process where your body processes it and makes the spike protein. Okay. You know, Doc, I want to get your take on, uh, you know, Kauai, we had three more cases today, um, travel-related cases, and, you know, I, we they, we had the quarantine in place, and then we, you know, we decided to go back on the safe travel, so now people with the one test can come to Kauai <clears throat> quarantine-free, but 
I asked this of Dr. Miskovich when he was on our show a week ago. And I said, you know, because he, he was trying to tell us that the safe travel program was working. And, you know, I, there's definitely, it, it does help. I mean, of course, a safe travel program is better than no program. But I asked him, can you explain why Kauai has so many travel related cases? And we don't hear that coming from the outer islands. Uh, the other islands is, you know, the important numbers. And he said that, that he doesn't know, he, you know, he thinks it might be a different different demographic of traveler. But mm -hmm. any, any thoughts on that, on why is Kauai, for some reason, is it because we're the only ones actually counting and reporting them? But I, I cannot believe the demographic of traveler is going to be the reason uh, the virus shows up on Kauai via, via traveler. I think for one, we do a better job at contact tracing. And, and, it, and partly that's just, we have a manageable population. And I think that the district health office has, um, you know, developed resources so, so we can do a better job at it. So I think we're better at connecting things to travel. Um, you might've noticed today, they added some extra detail about whether it was inter-island travel or um, they called it mainland travel or trans-Pacific travel, which is actually something that you know, some of the people in the work group I work with, we, we ask for. So there's also loud mouths like me and other people that are like, you know, we want this data, you know, and um, thank you because it's relevant. You know, we sort of have three pathways into Kauai now and we should be evaluating which pathway is, is causing more issues. I think on the other islands, uh, we've talked about this before, there's a, it gets to a point of saturation and, and surge and uh, where you can't really connect it to travel anymore. And you might have seen the, um, the, the earlier this week, there was the county, um, um, you know, video they do on Facebook with the mayor and then Dr. Berryman came on and she even said in the past two weeks, I believe it was seven cases that were categorized as community, community spread, but really only two of them had no connection to travel. So right. I think people don't appreciate that they, they don't call it travel related unless you can clearly call it travel related. So even our, our one death that we had was doing a lot of driving of people who were travelers and you know probably got it from one of the travelers, but could not be connected to, to a specific positive traveler. So therefore was called community acquired. So you know, I, I think that's one of those kind of misnomers that people are getting told, well, it's community acquired. You look at the curve and it says community acquired or there's a lot of unknown. And, and, the, and we've said this before, but the worse you do at contact tracing, the more likely it is that you're gonna call cases community acquired. Um, so people just kind of need to accept that that's the way it is. I do think that, you know, because of having good people, interested people and other people, you know, in the community pressuring our public health authorities and our our um, government that they're forthcoming about that information. I and mean, we also had for the first time in this, the, the press release, I mean, for the first time in a while, another um, pre-test positive received results after coming to Kauai, which also is not really being shared openly uh, um, on, on the other islands from what I can see. Um, I did wanna mention that, you know, we've talked about prevalence before and, uh, you probably remember from the press conference that whole iceberg idea of case prevalence versus, mm -hmm. you know, true prevalence or population wide prevalence. I went back today to look at the uh, source where um, the state leaders that that came up with, you know, the safe travels were saying that, you know, the, the risk is going to be one in a thousand um, as far as, you know, travelers and entering Hawaii undetected that are infectious. And you probably remember for our press conference, everything we're looking at is saying it's at least more like six or seven per thousand. And I'm hearing Lauren Pang's study on, on Maui is confirming about seven per thousand and he's finalizing his data to get it out. So, you know, we, we want to see what those are. But California at that time was 1% prevalent and right now is 4%. So it has quadrupled, you know, as far as California's prevalence by that same source, Hawaii's prevalence is 0.7%. So you look at the two pathways, you know, so are you you're getting, you know, let's just, you know, pretend that everybody's come from California, but I believe it is the most populous, you know, I mean, most of the travelers, it's like the number one state where travelers are coming from that would come to Hawaii. Well, let's just say California, you know, so they do this one, uh, they do a, a pre-travel test and then one at day three within a bubble resort. 
you know, depending on the efficacy of the test, you know, antigen versus PCR, that is probably going to cut the amount in half, you know. So, um, sorry, that's confusing the way I said it. So, uh, one free travel test for safe travels will cut out, you know, a certain amount of numbers. Add another test at day three, that will cut, you know, the people that got through, it will catch about half of those people. Yeah. So, you have one plan, you know, that, that's about twice as good as the other. But the people that are coming in under that plan are more li likely to have come from a place that might be four times as high. We just have to see how it's going to play out. But both of those plans have risk involved. Um, and I, there's a lot of pressure, you know, from, um, from business, you know, businesses to not do, uh, you know, any of this stuff that's beyond safe travels. Um, but they both have their risk and we just need to be watching. And I appreciate that the county is, our county is more willing to, you know, really kind of look at that and start, um, we call it granularity, but break down the data into specific categories that help us evaluate whether a specific part of the program is good or not. And I think we also do need to keep in mind that third pathway, which is the 10 day quarantine and whether those people that can come in with zero testing and a 10 day quarantine are, are also, uh, you know, problematic. So uh, I think hey, we doc, should be looking at all three. You know, Doc, I wanted to say that, you know, one of the things that Mel and I, we were very, very hopping from day one was about the contact tracing, right? In order to get any viable data that will give you, well, I, I think Kauai does it better than the, other, the, the rest of the counties. But in order, in order for you to get some specific data, you gotta, you, you gotta have a team that once somebody reports the infection, they, they got to be able to track that thing relentlessly until they can't track it anymore. I, that's the only way you're probably going to tell, right? Right. You know, and we've mentioned this before. I think you guys come at it from a detective standpoint, which I love. You know, I mean, that's one perspective looking at it. But really, the focus on, on contact tracing is who, did, who could that person have transmitted it to? You know, like preventing the, the you know, the forward part of it. And right. if there's not as, as much emphasis on where did you get it from, you know, that's sort of like a secondary emphasis. And I don't blame contact tracers for having that because you're trying to stop disease. You know, it's not necessarily that, that a contact tracer's job is to try to, you know, connect it to another and find out what the best policy is, you know. Um, but, yeah, you know, it, it depends on your resources and how willing you are to try to trace that through. And, um like a lot of things on Kauai, coconut wireless, you know, you can just kind of like hear things that will connect things to other people that, that will help you. And then I also think there's a better trust level on Kauai where, you know, people interacting with contact tracing here are more likely to be forthcoming about what they've done and who they contact and what they were doing. And it might not be the same, the same way on the other islands. I can tell you on Kauai, we get, we get people that post that they tested positive on Facebook, we get people that posted about their families because of their courtesy, the respect for everyone else. Uh, and, you know, I have not seen that except here on Kauai. I have not seen anyone come on Facebook and say, hey, you know, our family had to travel for, you know, emergency reasons. And then the family tested positive. Just want to let you guys know, everybody that came in contact with us, that, that's incredible. I, I don't think that exists anywhere else. And, uh, you know, we, we talked about it on our show and she posted it on our show and uh, I'm not going to repeat the name now, but they, they, uh, they had absolutely no problem informing the public that, um, I mean, it's not their fault. You don't go out and go catch COVID on purpose, you know? So, right. I think, I mean, I that's the have, Malama Kekahi Kekahi. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I and mean, I that's... think Kauai, I think we, we have a more a bigger presence of that than, than maybe on the other the outer islands. Thank God. Yeah, I agree. So I know you had some other things that you wanted to chat about, Doc. Um, I know we took you down. <laughs> we, you know, when we get you on, we like just bombard you, that's why. We just like bombard you. And you, you're so well, well loved. You helped you know? me learn too by the question. But yeah, I thought I would talk a little bit more about vaccine contraindications and, and reactions. Um, I got my second dose yesterday. Uh, you know, people are asking a lot about what the side effects are. Um, I shared the, my first dose, I felt a little, 
kind of tired, a little achy the first day, arm sore the second day, normal the third day. The second one, I, I felt nothing, you know, none of that stuff that I thought I felt the first the first round and my arm is a little bit sore, same kind of thing. That's mostly what I hear from people. Arm sore, maybe a little bit of symptoms, you know, for a, for a short amount of time. I, I joked with one of our, I think one of our viewers that, you know, it was so mild for me and I was on vacation to the, that I think I just kind of wanted an excuse to be lazy for the day. So it, it really was not not very bad at all, but I didn't have to work. Today I had to work and so I didn't, and yesterday too, so I didn't think about it at all, just get work done. So, um, you know, the, the vast majority of people have, have, that I've had contact with had very little reaction. Most of it is just local muscle sore. Um, but we are finding more out about these anaphylaxis, severe um, allergy reactions, which is of all the things that you've heard, you know, I mean, I've read there was a case of encephalomyelitis. You might have heard there was a doctor that had a stroke and low platelets in Florida, Bell's palsy, infertility. All of those sound like either that, that there's not good evidence that was related to the vaccine or it's difficult to tell because it's such a, a, a rare case. It, ha it can happen anyway. You don't know if it was connected to the vaccine, you know, related to the huge numbers of people who have gotten it. But for anaphylaxis, Somewhere between one in 50,000 and one in 100,000 people have had allergic reactions and severe allergic reactions to the vaccine, which is about 10 times higher than, than most vaccines. So, I mean, that's a real thing to keep in mind. And um, I did hear from Dr. Berryman today, you know, anytime the state does something, they're way more, you know, cautious about administering things. So they're not administering, and we're being told not to administer the vaccine to anyone who's had a severe allergy to an injectable medicine or the contents of the vaccine. And the, the one content of the vaccine, the one common thing I saw is called polyethylene glycol, which is, is a common medicine for constipation. I've never had any patient ever had a reaction to it, but um, you know, that's something to have on your, your radar. Um, but the state, I believe that they're, they're, not, um, they're not giving the vaccine to other people who've had severe allergies to things like eggs or bee stings or other things that have nothing to do with injectable medicines. But, that's not really a clear contraindication, and probably we're going to be looking at, you know, and other entities other than state, other than the state, are probably going to still give the vaccine in those situations. Um, and the state is looking at, you know, not, you know, not turning people away because of that. But right now, it does sound like there's a good chance you you will be turned away if you had a severe allergy to um, uh, an injectable medicine and severe allergy usually means anaphylaxis, which is like, you know, blood pressure drops, you're just, you know, you have to go to the ER, get epinephrine, or the um, angioedema, like throat swelling, difficulty breathing, that kind of stuff. Um, generally hives, you know, they're kind of in a gray area, but if it was just hives and nothing more, then I don't think most people think of that as a severe allergy. Um, and I did read recently in the CDC that they do not recommend taking Benadryl before the um, vaccine if you've had a history of hives, although I, I even know doctors that did that, you know, um, but their rationale is that they, they don't recommend it because it can mask the early signs of anaphylaxis. And then, you know, there's, there's a, a longer wait period. If you have a history of allergies, you're supposed to wait for 30 minutes. Um, and so there's more likelihood that you will not manifest anything for those 30 minutes. And then later when you're doing whatever, you know, and you're not close to the hospital where you get care, that the problem could occur. So that, that's the CDC recommendation. But that's really just, that, that's the one thing to keep in mind. And um, my patients that I've had that did not have an injectable allergy, you know, I've, I prescribed them an EpiPen and I've, you know, recommended that they get it at a hospital. I know that there are plans um, between, between the district health office and the leaders of the hospitals to keep, you know, to the people that were turned away from the, the, um, the county vaccines to let them go to the hospital and get their vaccine so they can get it in a, in a safer setting, you know, in case something's going to happen. That's so cool. um, th that's the, the contraindication part that I wanted to explain about the vaccine. The, you know, I, the only reaction I had, I, I, got, I got my vaccine on my left arm and uh, the next day my right arm felt like I had the shot. Is there any relation to that or is it just I'm going crazy? Which, he was, which, he was uh, looking in the mirror. He, he, he was looking in oh, the mirror when he was rubbing the right. pain. Yeah. yeah. Because I was I was going like this is difficult. 
your, your band-aid stay on the other arm. I say, I know, but for some reason, it feels like it's on me. <laughs> so, Doc, I, I was, I was um, going to ask you, which, which, which arm um, do you use to eat your uh, extra large Snickers with? <laughs> the right, the right. <laughs> yeah, probably the right, probably the right. Yeah, and Doc, say, I was uh, to uh, give a free plug. I hate here. when he does that, man. I hate when he does that. Sorry, Mal. But I, we didn't we didn't plan I just, that either. I gotta drink my coffee. Sorry. <laughs> it's Snickers flavored coffee. All right, Snickers flavored coffee. Yeah, Doc. I um, we're scheduled to get the uh, 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 or the shots are available today for for my office and. <clears throat> But I checked with my doctor because I had, uh, and I'd love to get your take on this. I know you've never examined me. You don't know my medical history, but generally speaking, um, and I'm not going to use this as a second opinion, don't worry. But I had, uh, when we are in the police department, we were required to take the three-shot hepatitis series. And I got, a, after the first shot, I had a reaction. I had like, like I, got, I got the hive, but I also got uh, some flu-like symptoms. I guess I felt like I was sick and the, they they rec recommended that I don't take the rest. I'm also allergic to penicillin and I'm allergic to another some pain medication that they gave me when I had my surgery. And I just like thought I was going to die. I had this um, flush feeling. My face <laughs> felt like it was on fire. And So is that should I my doctor said to wait. Um, or, or if I go get an EpiPen from you and, and just go get them at a hospital and wait and then whack myself, or I can use Charlie's EpiPen, I think it's probably against the law, but don't tell nobody. If, if, if that was your, I mean, what, what, what is your recommendation? Yeah, I, I would, I would say get it in a hospital or wait until you can get it in a hospital for someone with a history like you. The, the other factor that somewhat influences it is what is your job and what how much risk do you have in your job you know so i mean i guess if you were i guess like for example screening at the airport or you know doing something where you see a lot of you know a lot of people a day you can get exposed then you, that weighs into the decision as well as far as you know what are your activities you know beyond the the risk so it's always this risk benefit you know thing that you have to weigh out but I would say for you, uh, because I, I think that there's a good chance that we're going to be offering it to people like you at the hospital soon, that you're probably going to get it. You know, you're probably going to have an opportunity to get it soon, like within the next month. So that's a reasonable time to wait for most people's occupational risks. Thank you, Doc. Yeah, I know someone someone just said that should be a question for my PCP. I did ask my PCP. I was just curious, generally speaking, if it was if it was a patient of yours and that was the type of history. You know, so yeah, I was not asking him for medical advice, but that would not be a problem. I don't, I, I, I don't mind. I know how it is. You know, you get doctors on the show, you might as well ask. You know, same thing. You're going to be at the barbecue, people ask you questions. You know, <laughs> it's just how it is. It's part of the, you know, part of the game. Well, I, otherwise, I got to ask Charlie. And, you know, Char <laughs> Charlie. That's, 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 a, that's a dangerous proposition. You know, you ask me. That, it's kind of. <laughs> Charlie had his degree in, in snickerology, you know. It's, it's... <laughs> That's a good well, one. The, the, the other big question, Doc, and I, I, I'm not sure um, uh, <clears throat> what your thoughts are, but this whole thing about, and I heard it today again, uh, I keep hearing it. It's about the, the once you get vaccinated, <clears throat> are you still able to carry and pass on the virus. We know that the jury's still out on that, but uh, I hear some, some leaders and experts uh, infer that once you get the, the vaccine, you're immune. And I've been reading up today, I was reading a, a bunch of studies that I, I read from different universities that are say, that's saying it takes a while for this vaccine to start to build the antibodies. So, you know, not even talking about whether you, you, you carry or not carry, the fact is that even after you get this vaccine, it still takes a pretty good amount of time. I think one of the studies was like 12 days to get to that full antibody stage, um, which I think they said at the, at the first shot, it's like 48% or something or 52% uh, protection. But what's your take on that, on that whole, that whole debate about well, no. What happens you, after you get the vaccine? 
before he answers, I, I will interject this. I'm going to let him answer, but I, I know who you're referring to. If someone says that once you take this vaccination, right, you, you're, you're totally, you're immune, right, 100%. If that was the case, then I would think the FDA would be approving this thing already, right? So because they don't have the information, the FDA is not going, not going to step in right now to approve it. Well, I, so I, what I did want to say is that you can see from the trials, there, there are clear um, recommendations about how long it takes to reach the 94 and 95% immunity efficacy based on the trials. I think I have it memorized correctly that Pfizer was at seven days after the second dose and um, Moderna is at 10 days, if I remember correctly. But a good rule of thumb is two weeks after your second dose, you're you probably achieved that that full immunity, but that doesn't that doesn't mean that you know that doesn't settle the whole issue about whether you could transmit the virus. Mm -hmm. I do think it's a reasonable inference that people getting the vaccine would not be able to transmit it, but you know people who know more than me, experts are are saying the same thing that you cannot trust that based on the way that the trial was done. So just because we want something to be true doesn't mean that it is, you know, I mean, and it's kind of like, uh, to me, it kind of goes back to hydroxychloroquine, like you can want there to be a great treatment out there. But until the data proves that it's a great treatment. It's not true. And, and you can't, you know, you can't start um, treating people or making public policy based on things that have not been verified. Or you or you or to me, it, it's unwise to do that. Because it hasn't been verified, you know, um, so yeah, I I know there's an urgency to it. I feel like we've kind of, I, I guess I kind of think that the state has addressed that urgency pretty well. I mean, there was, what, almost 17,000 travelers, you know, in that week before Christmas. I mean, so there's been, a, you know, if that's the urgency, there's a lot of people coming, you know. And so I guess the, the idea that, you know, now we need to get some more and, and, and loosen up the vaccine, you know, loosen up because of the vaccine before it's been verified, I think is, is, not justified so i it's an, it's something that everybody's interested in just wait for the data i guess as far as, far as i'm concerned that you know they're looking they're looking at the data just just wait for it well you know mel um because you brought out the snickerology you should read the comments what you started <laughs> a lot of which one uh, no when you talked about the snickerology oh uh, boy. Got, dana moore said uh charlie take two snickers and call me in the morning <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I don't even have a damn snicker, man, and much less two. Um, so I guess Doc, the, the the bottom line is this: until and and I we talked I talked to Charlie today, and I and I called him a hero. All of everyone that has taken the vaccine um, or are going to take the vaccine, you know that that that's part of the process, and and we'll see people get tested, and and we'll find out as time goes on. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not how 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 great this immunity is, and and um, hopefully it's like other vaccines that'll that that'll protect everyone. But I like the way you answered that, and that's why we like having you on the show because it's just to the point. And uh, until we get the data, we gotta still gotta wear your mask. You still gotta social distance. You still gotta wash your hands. You still gotta stay away from gatherings. I mean, that's just because you got the the vaccine. I think that's kind of what. I was hoping you, you would talk about too is the importance of continuing the regimen, the safety regimen after the, the vaccine. Right. I, I think, you know, the other additional part to that is, you know, it, if you tell people, oh, you know, you don't need to wear a mask if you've been vaccinated. I mean, what a mess we're going to have, you know, I mean, like, because we have all these, you know, these knuckleheads or whatever that, you know, don't want to wear their mask anyway. And so, in public, you know, we, you're not going to have as much of that, you know, the, the, the cultural norm that you wear masks, you know, and then how are you going to know if that person really got the vaccine or not? And people are really, really devious about how they do things sometimes. You know, they'll fake documents. That's happened for, you know, people that were trying to come to Hawaii for, you know, whatever reason. They've done all kinds of things, fake test results, fake letters from Department of Health saying they're released from isolation. So it's problematic from that standpoint. And I think we just need to try to keep setting that bar high, you know, for our community 
you know, like the things you pointed out, people willing to, you know, let people know if they had COVID. I, I do um, want to mention that we, it still looks like, if you believe the DOH's data, it still looks like, like Kauai is way worse than the rest of the island as far as mask wearing. They have us at like 76% or something, which is actually not that bad compared to the rest of the United States. I mean, that that's not too bad. But compared to the rest of Hawaii, which is very good, it looks bad. I still don't know how they get those numbers, but um, I... I I, I love all our residents, you know, and I really, I feel like my perspective has a lot to do with getting our residents back, but I think we do need to somewhat be called out for that. And, and you know, we're lucky that we took some extra measures to um, make ourselves safer than safe travels, but that doesn't mean it lets us, lets us off the hook. We're still having cases and we're having a lot of cases from, from, um, from residents who traveled over the holidays and then are, you know, came back and are, are transmitting it. So there's still an importance there, regardless of the vaccine and, uh, you know, regardless of whether we have the most rigid travel restrictions or not. You know, um, one thing, one thing I wanted to ask you, and again, it's, you kind of touched on it, what, what, what Mel said, is that, you know, it, it's, it's already hard by nature, right? Human nature. Some people, can take orders relatively good and some people just are born not to take orders. And usually those are the ones that usually end up in prison because they just don't wanna follow the rules. Knowing that, why do you think the state effort of messaging, con continually messaging, because it doesn't seem like they're, they're doing a good job at it, you know? Because we said you take the vaccine, until the jury is back and lets us know, okay, X, Y, Z, this is what's going to take place if you got vaccinated. They give us the, you know, the holy grail. They tell us everything. Until that comes out, we still got to operate under the means that when this, when this uh, pandemic first started, and that is wear your mask, look at this, is wash your hands, you know, and all that stuff. What do you think needs to be done in getting more efficient in getting the word out because it's you know when, when sometimes when you get the lieutenant governor saying certain things now and again i understand nobody wants to be political about it but you call a spade a spade when he says something that kind of goes directly and we don't have to say it you just look at the comments that flies out you know when he does his morning uh newscast right the comments are flying off the hook man it's like Bro, what did you what did you smoke? You know, what did you eat last night? Because it just doesn't make sense what he's saying. Do you think that that in and of itself, because it seems disturbing in a way, it, it only lays credence to why people shouldn't wear a mask if, if you're coming out with 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 uh, you know with things like that. What's your take on it, Dada? I understand the frustration. I mean, I think I feel some of those things as well. But, you know, just because I don't like the policy that's coming down from the state level doesn't mean that I'm going to, you know, uh, stick finger to my neighbor. I mean, I just, you know, like it's, it's I, I don't like it, but that doesn't mean that, you know, I'm not going to be willing to take steps to protect our community. I, I guess I, I'm not sure what, you know, I hear a lot of messaging coming out and I hear what you're saying. You know, if the leaders that are giving messaging out, if people believe in those leaders, they're more willing to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't have a good handle on who the people are in Kauai that might not be wearing masks because, you know, the where I, you know, I basically live between Kalaheo and Waimea. That's pretty much my main thing. I go to Lihue every once in a while. I rarely go anywhere else on the island. To me, I, every, you know, I mean, I see it. I would have guessed we're at like 95 based on my experience, you know, so mm -hmm. I don't see that number that, that they're talking about. I, I don't, I don't know how to answer your thing about Im improved messaging other than that, you know, it, it, it's, you can do all you like with PSAs and make them sound good and, and try to message them the way they are. But I think there is a, um, a value to um, leadership that inspires, um, you know, hope and, and confidence. And I think the downside to the way that safe travels has been, um, promoted in the way that the data about it has kind of been spun afterwards is it feels like for a lot of residents that the fingers are being pointed at you, 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 you know, like you're bad, you're bad, you're bad, you know, like stop being so bad. So 
I get what you're saying. You know, there probably is some frustration. Well, like, well, when is it good enough? You know, how long do we have to keep doing it? Mm -hmm. And I guess all I can say to people is if that's the way you feel about the leadership, well, that's the leadership. You know, that's not our people. Yeah. You know, and, and you, you still have to care about our people and our communities. And, and we're going to try to do the best thing we can, we can for each other. And you try to influence things the best you can, which, which brings me to something I probably should have said from the beginning. Mm -hmm. One of the most important things right now I think people need to voice their opinion about to their representatives is this proposal from uh, Representative um, um, uh, Psyche about, you know, the bill to, it sounds basically to force all the islands onto one plan. I, I to me, that's ridiculous. You know, I mean, look at the differences between the islands. It's, it's, you know, Maui is completely different. Kauai is completely different. And that has to do, has a lot to do with policy decisions that were made at the county level. I, I, so I think we need to be, you know, voicing loudly about, about that situation and, and try to prevent that from happening. And that's certainly something that the people that, um, you know, I work with are, are going to try to um, get out. Um, so I'm hoping that our leadership, our representatives from Kauai, um, will be voicing their opinion in opposition um, to that idea. Well, I, you know, just a little recap. We asked our viewers to write or uh, email or call every single one of their representatives and senators. Well, Senator Kochi, Senate President Kochi came on our show. He asked to come on. Uh, and basically the, the resounding, uh, well, I shouldn't say resounding because majority of the reps and senators did not respond uh, to our viewers. Uh, throughout the state. The ones that did, the vast majority said, um, I don't think it's fair to comment because I haven't read the bill. Well, the, the whole point wasn't about the bill. It was about, do you support uh, easing up on the travel restrictions? So uh, Senator Kochi said, you know, he, he, he wasn't gonna commit one way or the other until he talks to the mayor and the councils and everybody else and, and the representatives. Uh, yesterday, we got a response from Jimmy Tokioka. Representative Jimmy Tokioka. Jimmy Tokioka was the only representative, the only response that I got so far from our viewers that said, I do not support the bill. I do not think the state has any business in the outer islands business. So that deserves a clap, Charlie. A Mel and Charlie clap. Tokioka was the only one while I can appreciate Senator Kochi's response, Senator uh, Representative Nick Nakamura responded saying that she, she doesn't support, I mean, she supports uh, that they'll, they'll talk about and discuss with the, with the other representatives. She, do, she does not support a one size fits all is what she said, but she hadn't seen the bill. So I just wanted you guys know, and it's not too late to call and email your representatives and senators and let them know. Uh, it's very simple. We, we don't of, want that bill to even be heard. One of our viewers I just think said that he, he, uh, he, got, he, he followed your lead, he saw your video, and uh, Corey uh, on, our, on our feed said that he wrote to Representative Kong and he wrote back and said he's not in support of what uh, speaker psyche is willing to propose. He's not. He's not in support of that. So it's it, it, it's getting his message out there. Okay. Well, thank you guys. And if 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 and if I misspoke, and if any one of you had a different response, send it to me, and we'll definitely make sure that the viewers know who is in fact concerned about our our uh, our islands, our counties. I hear that it's may, we maybe have about a week away until it would be heard. So some, it's you know, gonna drop, it, now's it's the gonna, time. It's going to drop on the 20th yeah. inauguration day. And I'm not going to go there, but I'm just going to say that, you know, it may cause some issues on the 20th at the Capitol. But that's the day the bill drops. That's the bill that they drop. So, Can I mention man, what, what I know we're going to wrap up. I just wanted to mention one thing because I, I I'll talked stay on to as long as you want to stay on, Doc, man. Yeah. We'll stay on as long as I, you do, Doc. You know, I hear a lot of I hear a lot of pushback about the um, change in travel restrictions, and and a lot of the pushback I hear is, but look at the hospitals; they're not full, or look at the ICU beds; they're not full. The ventilators aren't full. And I, I look, Hyema has the best data on that. You know, I mean, well, the most data on that, I should say. 
Um, and it doesn't look like they're full either. But, you know, a patient of mine uh, posted on Facebook recently about, her, you know, her significant other who waited 14 hours to be transferred to Queens because beds were full with COVID. So it might not look that way, but when situations, you know, with, with discharges and admissions and facilities with some capacity or capabilities that they don't have at other capabilities, you know, just because there are beds open doesn't mean that your family member might not get into a situation where they can't get the care that they need because, you know, there are COVID beds that are full. Um, and I, I, I have to admit that surprised me, but, you know, I did want to mention that, um, that that situation is occurring, even though the numbers sometimes look like there's a lot of capacity. Um, and I just also wanted to mention that, you know, I know we've been conditioned to think about hospital capacity as indicating something about that we're in a good state. But, you know, when I read literature about COVID, they talk about that as being a lagging indicator. You know, so if your hospitals are starting to get overwhelmed, you're behind the game. You know, it takes cases rise and then about two weeks later, hospitalizations rise. So if you're talking about trying to change, you know, screening policy, travel policy, testing policy, it's, that's pretty late if you're looking at hospitalizations. And I don't mean this as an inflammatory statement. I, I want it to be thought provoking, but I want people to think about like, since when did the healthcare system become a safety me mechanism solely in service of a certain part of the economy? So for example, fireworks are dangerous, you know, and they are illegal, you know, even though people still use them. Unfortunately, we had a fatality from a firework, you know, over over um, New Year's Eve. Now, nobody says, well, but look, the firemen aren't busy. You know, the fire departments are are, are ready to handle the, the you know, the, the complications that can come from fireworks. You know, that's not to me, that's not a good way to make public policy, you know, to, to allow dangerous things to happen because the safety mechanisms that you have are not overwhelmed yet. So I, I, I just wanted to kind of throw, th throw that thought out to people that it's kind of a problematic way to, to me to be thinking about a pandemic in the, in the terms of hospital capacity and not be talking about things like, oh, our, can our kids go back to school safely, which I, I think is just something that's you know, more tangible and important. So um, I hope it doesn't create a lot of controversy, but I think I would like people to sort of like try to think a bit, a little bit more outside the box about how hospital capacity relates to um, policy decisions. You know, what's really funny is, um, and I, I'm glad you're willing to stay with us because I can talk to you all night because, you know, just reading the comments, people are loving it. You know, they get an insight, but that's how it was before in the police department, you know, we, we got to a point where we're, the police department was, was doing so much patrol and the crime rate, when it started to go down, they say, well, now maybe you don't need that many cops on the road because there's not that many stuff happening. I said, okay, <laughs> if you feel that way, then all of a sudden, you know, the bad guys saw, hey, there's not that many, many blue lights on the road, dude. Everything started to spiral back up again. You know, all I can say, Doc, is, um, you know, we saw these clusters build up in uh, Queens Medical Center, right? And, and I was shocked to see where one of them were. And, and, and they said it was uh, on the sixth floor, the cardiac floor. That's where I was. I, I know that, that floor because I, after my surgery, I used to have to walk TT, walk that whole floor. I mean, and to think that they had, a, you know, they had a breakout in that, area it, it is scary it is scary because everybody's hooked up in that area and you know it's it's not over there just for oh we're going to observe you and watch you. you you get some pretty you get some pretty sick people in that area now you got to deal with covid on top of that so i think you know people got to understand that too you know you, you just cannot go pitch a puck tent and put up one oxygen machine and you know all these other stuff with the monitor on cardiac patients it's just not going to work you know, it's, it's designed, the way it's built is designed to have them in a specific area, so. You know, unfortunately, that's how it's been though, Doc, and you know this, we all know that. From the beginning, um, we were always told, you know, the numbers of cases isn't important, it's the capacity, it's the, the fact 
how we can respond to cases in the hospital. And the hospital uh, capacity is really what we are looking at, not so much the numbers. If you watch the mayor of uh, Victorino's press conference today, when he gave the, the, the statistics, he said, uh, Maui Hospital is at 59%, ICU beds are at 49%, and he said, but only two COVID patients. What the hell does the type of patient matter? I don't care if you have a freaking COVID or uh, a stroke, a heart attack, uh, a car accident. An ICU bed that is taken is an ICU bed that is taken, regardless of how. But you, you hit it right on the head, Doc. The focus has been on the industry that we can allow the tourists as long as we can manage the surge. And we get assured all the time about surge capacity. Well, if we didn't have an issue, this person that messaged me said that their relative had to wait in an ambulance for four hours. An ambulance for four hours because there was no room. So I don't know how they get these statistics that where hospital capacities are, are at the lowest. I can tell you, we have friends that work in hospitals on Oahu and they're telling us a different story. They're not telling us the 50%. They're saying 90, 95% full. So I don't get it. it and, and, and they broadcast this message but people know because people, you know, it's, we live in a small state. We live in a very small community where people talk. Nurses will share. Man, that's, that's BS, man. I, you know, we're at, we're at 89, we're at 92%, we're at 98%. So the, the, the value or the, the believability of the statement put down the toilet. So we, I, I'll never forget this, Charlie. You remember this. I can't remember the doctor's name from Utah. What was his name? Kimball. Doctor. Was it Kimball? And yeah, he said, Kimball. he said, you know, two weeks ago, we were just like Hawaii. That time, our numbers were low in Hawaii. And he said, right now, we're 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 panicking. We don't we don't have enough. People are dying. I see I see people dying every day. Two weeks ago. So that's why I question why we why are we testing the system? That, that's what we're doing. We're testing the system. The thing hits you hard really quickly. And we have no ability to to recover from that kind of surge. But they, 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 they just does not impact them like it does most of us. And I, I think that's what that's my biggest fear is we'll get a surge that we cannot handle. And then there'll be some serious consequences, you know. You know, the, the other thing that that's frightening, Doc, and I, I don't know if you're experiencing it, but when you get a surge, like what Honolulu is facing in the hospitals, right? A lot of times the, the staff get sick. A lot of times the staff get positive, right? When they got to go out, <laughs> where where does the reinforcements come from to fill in those slots? Because now, now you get full of pukas, right? Well, they brought in from the mainland, you know, but if the mainland is surging too, are you going to have people to, to, to be free? I mean, that brings up another thing that I'm I'm interested in is so once we healthcare workers get vaccinated, if we get exposed, you know, if we're a close contact of a case, do we still go but go to work? You know, I mean, or do we have to still quarantine? Kind of like the travel issue, and more important than the travel travel issue, frankly, as far as I'm concerned. So I mean, that's another thing that we need to get from the data about whether you know we can still do our jobs. That's the intention of why to hit healthcare workers early, right? You know, that we don't get sick and then we don't uh, transmit it to our own patients or people we're caring for. But if, if you get vaccinated and your symptoms are minimized or, or, or nil because of the vaccination, but the jury is still out about whether you can, you can carry and transmit, then actually from the vaccination itself, uh, the unintended consequences, you become a uh, asymptomatic carrier. <laughs> right. Right, and that's a huge risk to take for the person and for a health organization. So, I, um, you know, I, I'm going to be asking questions to see what the bigger organizations are going to do about that. You know, um, so we'll we'll see with that. Good, good. 
Well, Doc, it's uh, it's we we went twenty minutes over. I appreciate your time. You got you're always uh, you're always awesome. Um, any any closing thoughts for our viewers? Uh, you know, I, I had to give a present. I had to give a presentation to um, some Kumuhula. I don't know if you guys heard about this. It was pretty awesome. This big group of Kumuhula came together and, and posed uh, their own kapu called Lahui Kanaka back in, uh, I think it was September. I think, you know, it's part of the effort that really got our case, you know, the, the whole um, August kind of surge starting, you know, getting in the right direction. Um, and they wanted to hear about the vaccine. So we, we, were, we were talking about the vaccine. Um, and one, we t I, I had to do a little bit of reading about Lili Okalani, our, you know, our last reigning monarch and her, her history. You know, she, as a child, she saw the measles uh, epidemic and saw how it decimated the population, which was mostly Native Hawaiians. But, you know, Hawaii residents, I, and I want to point out that the Hawaiian kingdom was not all Native Hawaiians. There were other people that lived in, in the Hawaiian kingdom before the overthrow. When, the, when smallpox arrived, she was given the task of, what to do and she shut down the ports and she shut down travel and she was not popular with business people because of that and i think that was part of what fueled the eventual eventual overthrow but you know I, as a hawaii resident as a hawaiian i read that history and it, it it's inspiring to me to look back at that you know over 100 was 130 years ago or so you know there's a similar situation and you know, a leader that loved Hawaii and loved its people was willing to step up and make the hard decision, you know, to, to, to protect the people in the face of a lot of uh, pressure from business people. Um, that's what she did. Uh, she didn't have the tool of having a vaccine, you know, at that time, but um, we have it now. And so, you know, I see the efforts that we're doing as, as you know, I, I'm, that's not my lineage. I'm not going to say that, you know, I, I, I'm doing what Lili would have done, but it feels to me consistent with what, you know, our leadership would have done for our people. And it, it um, inspires me to kind of keep on doing all the efforts we can with the vaccine, you know, prevent exposure and everything we can to, um, to minimize this risk and minimize the, um, bad, the um, bad outcomes that could have on our people. But the last thing I wanted to say is that you know, you guys talked about this. I, I have this idea in my mind of this event that could happen once this is all settled. And I hope it all goes that way. I think you guys are talking about the Aloha Stadium. Oh, no, Vadina Stadium. But, but um, the, you know, the Vadina Stadium event. And, uh, you know, so that's what I closed with with them. I said, you know, we're, this is our best chance with the vaccines. It's our best chance to have the things that we used to love. You know, the luau, the, the um, hula huike, the concerts. And to be able to um, greet people, honey people, um, and and not feel apprehension about it. And it just was some of the kumuhula, you know, they just responded. They said they were just like, that is what I want. That's what I want. Um, so, you know, since we had that conversation, I you know, I kind of have that, you know, that that event as a, uh, something in my mind, and it's it's really hopeful. So. Um, you know, those days I get tired and I'm like, oh, when is this going to end? You know, I, I, I love having that idea. I, I hope that we can work towards it. And so I really appreciate, you know, you guys planting that seed in my mind before. Right on, right on. Charles. Well, again, I'd just like to thank you, uh, Kapono. It's, oh, man, for the first time I met you all the way into now, it's, it's only gotten better. You're just having this discussion with you. And you know, I like the fact that you, you, you know, that the Kanaka in you comes out, which you know, uh, no matter what race you are, we got to be proud of our race. You got to let it out. You know, there's, and yeah, and we got to do it in a responsible way. And 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 you've done that. I do want to tell our viewers, you know, just by what Dr. Capono has said tonight, we look to the past. Just so happens that in this day and age, we just had to modernize the edges to make it palatable, to be accepted. What Queen Lily Okalani did, maybe it was not popular, but it served its purpose. I hope and pray, and that's why we've always wanted the governor, that if we have to close down our borders, and if you have to find a way of doing it, you hold that key. But, you know, as we've all seen, a lot of times politics get in the way. When you're dealing with a pandemic, 
I, I know in this lifetime, and if I should live to the ripe old age of 100, I will be able to tell my grandkids one thing. And that is, when faced with difficulty, make sure politics is nowhere near that because it's only going to muddy the waters. It's only going to muddy the waters. If you guys believe in something that's, you know, you got to make a point and you do it in a respectful way, you bring everybody to the table and you talk about it and you show them the pros and cons, why we need to go down this path. Right now, as it stands, and you know this, Doc, because you've been intimately involved with it, you've got so much data just from the Kauai travel and what we're talking about. I know other islands don't understand that because they, they, haven't, they haven't had the kind of data that we have. But you'll, 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 you'll learn quickly once you st start seeing that data that you, know, you open the borders and you don't do it in a safe manner. We can get stung. Now the question will be, how fast can you recover from that? You think it's hard now. You just, you know, you just ask yourself, how, how fast do you think we can recover from that? So thank you so much. To our viewers for joining in tonight. Mel? Thanks, Charlie. Thank you, Doc. Uh, I'm glad you brought up the concert that Charlie gonna put on after this is all done. I use that as well. I use that as my light at the end of the tunnel. I bring it up quite frequently to our viewers that use that as the end, the finish line. Save, sacrifice, save that, that trip until after we reach. Come to the concert, food, music, dance, everything is going to be there. Charlie is a good man. Billy V, I just saw Billy V on the, on the comments. He will be the MC. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Capono will sing his rendition of some old Hawaiian song. I'm not sure which one yet, but it's going to be an event <laughs> of the century. But guys, we got to get there. And the only way we're going to get there is by being safe. Get your vaccine, wear your mask, uh, and, and we, uh, it's like preaching to the choir, but let's use that as the, the light at the end of the tunnel. I promise you this. And I always tease Charlie, you know, Charlie can put on a concert, Charlie can put on the concert. I've already received offers from a lot of people. And I'm sure, sure Charlie has that they all want to help. They all want to help put this big concert together and we will do it. We will do it, but we got to get to the other side. So we cannot do it without all of you. So anyway, guys, thank you. Capono, thank you so much again, man. You're a hero. Thank you for what you do. Keep doing what you're doing. Yep. You get the clap. You get the uh, clap. You get the Mel and Charlie clap, I should say. That didn't not come out right. Not the clap. Not the that, clap. The that man didn't come out right. <laughs> Tomorrow night, Feel Good Friday. Saturday night, Billy V for his uh, debut on the Mel and Charlie Club. So, guys, we love you guys. You guys take care. Stay safe. God bless. Aloha. Aloha.